Hi, good evening, and thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about the history of the W.J. Beale Botanical Garden on the campus of Michigan State University. I'm Frank Talewski, the curator of the Beale Botanical Garden and an associate professor in the Department of Plant Biology at Michigan State. Get the uh, technology to work here, and there we have our first slide. So, the uh, Beale Botanical Garden uh, was founded by Professor Beale shortly after his arrival. So, the Botanical Garden Michigan State Agriculture Garden was founded in 1873 uh, when Professor Beale started a collection of forage plants located in what today is known as Sleepy Hollow. And by 1877, the garden was widely recognized on the campus and was unoffic unofficially called the Wild Garden. So if you're a postcard collector and you go to some antique shops and antique shows and you go and flip through the MSU Lansing, East Lansing postcards and you see something that says the Wild Garden, that's a photograph of what is today the W.J. Beale Botanical Garden. Professor Beale always referred to it only as the Botanical Garden. Well, there's Professor Beale and a photograph of him. That tears not in the photograph, it's a little bit of the screen there, his forehead. But uh, this is a uh, portrait that was done of Professor Beale that hangs, it's actually a color portrait that hangs in the herbarium. Uh, down at Michigan State. And he was born on March 11th, in 1833, in Atrium, Michigan, and passed away in 1924, so had a very long, healthy life. I always like to kid with our uh, fellow colleagues down the road there, because we always have this good rivalry between the maize and blue and the green and white. Well, Professor Beale actually was a Wolverine. As you see, he earned his degree, his first degree, from the University of Michigan uh, between 1855 and 1859 and then taught at the uh, Friends Academy at Union, New York uh, in 18, uh, nine, um, pardon me, the 1875, I mean, 1855 to 1861. I'll change the dates on that. It was a typo. Anyway, he went on to Harvard University for his advanced degree, where he studied with Azure Gray and Louis Gassi, uh, and got his uh, degree then from Harvard before going on to Chicago, where he would taught for several years. And his first lecture was at Michigan Agricultural College, the original name for Michigan State University, in July 9th of 1870. Professor, uh, he became professor of botany and horticulture officially when he was hired on in 1871 and served in that capacity until 1881. Um, in the interim, uh, he got his master's at the University of Chicago and an honorary degree from the University of Michigan as well. Well, the horticulture department was split off as its own department. So really, when you look at the history of Michigan State, the hort department came, arose from the botany department, and the botany department became the botany and forestry department. Professor Beale showed a great interest in reforestation of the state. It was losing a lot of its forest resources uh, due to logging over the period of time. And so from 1881 to 1902, he was in charge professor of the botany and forestry department. In 1902, the forestry department was split off as its own independent department. And Professor Bogue, for whom Bogue Street on campus was named, became the first professor of the new forestry department. And uh, he was doing an honorary degree from Michigan State Agricultural College in 1905, and, uh, doctorate, and was a professor of botany. Now, the forestry and horticulture departments were their own standalone departments from 1903 until his retirement in 1910. And so, well, he, what he's best known for, one of the things he's best known for on the campus of Michigan State is the founding of the Beale Botanical Garden. He did many other things, including the very well-renowned seed experiment we'll talk about momentarily, but a lot of his research and a lot of his work at Michigan State focused on the very grounds of the Botanical Garden. And here's one of the earliest photos that we uh, have, we've been able to find. It's in the archives at Michigan State. And we see it's about 1870s. And this building in the background here that you can see is, in fact, Wells Hall. And we're not sure if this is Professor Beale or not. It could be a very young Professor Beale. That's sort of the type of, of, of clothing and such that he would have worn at the time, but many people wore that as well, so there's no verification. But again, the garden is in this area, and much further down, we can see some of the interpretive signs, a little bridge over here on this side. And later on, as we'll see, the garden expands over time. Well, where exactly on the campus is the Beale Botanical Garden? Well, here we see an old map from about 1924 that shows the locations of several buildings that you may be aware of. The best uh, known feature, of course, being the Red Cedar River, not a building at all, and Kalamazoo Street that comes up. Sparty, the statue of Sparty today, is located right here. This is the Women's Gymnasium, which is now the IM Circle, much larger building than it was back then because it's been added on to and expanded to consume about this much area. This is the old greenhouse, and this is the second Wells Hall, 
Bowles Hall, where my office is today, still exists, and here's the old chemistry laboratory. Well, if you go on the campus of Michigan State today, you'll know that the main library now occupies this almost this entire space, and the fountains in front of the library are located right there. So where does the garden fall in? Oh, by the way, the music building is right up here, where it says Armory. So these are old buildings back in the 1920s. And there we see where the Beale Garden fits in. This is a map that Professor Beale drew in about 1898 and published. And we'll see a blow up of that in the next slide. But the way he drew it, it's kind of odd in terms of its orientation. So here we can see there's a little stream that flowed through the Beale Garden down to the Red Cedar River and various beds with various collections of plants. And this is Sleepy Hollow. This area up here is the area where he started a lot of his plats and experiments with grasses and forage crops. And today, this is what we call Sleepy Hollow. The bridge that was right here was actually a stone arch bridge that connected these two parts of the garden where the stream would flow underneath. That has since been filled in, as you know, is no longer a bridge. A lot of the soil that was dug out of Sleepy Hollow to make it a larger depression was actually clay that was collected and used to make bricks for the original college hall that once stood where Beaumont Tower is today. Beaumont Tower was built in 1928, or completed in 1928. So let's keep this in mind in terms of the orientation. The next map shows the garden in blow up, as we can see, 1896, um, drawn by Professor Beale and published. And we see all the various families in the layout of the garden, and this is the garden part that was over Sleepy Hollow. And so we see a large collection of plant families. Uh, the major aspect of the collection was for teaching, and he taught uh, a variety of plant taxonomy classes and identification classes, and it was very important for him to have the material hands-on available right there for his students. One of his favorite sayings was, keep squinting. He always wanted the students to become a keen observer of the world around them. And the best way to do that, he would give them an assignment, give them a piece of a plant, a flower, and send them off and say, tell me everything you know about that plant. And the student would come back and say, well, it has so many petals and so many stems. Well, what else did you see? He said, keep squinting, go back, tell me more. And so the student really had to keenly observe the plant. And this gave him the, the material to really expand their knowledge and become keen observers. So here we can see the same shot a few years later, probably about the 1890s. We're not, we're not sure of the exact date. But you can see again, here's Wells Hall, the old, the first Wells Hall in the background. There's been three Wells Halls in the history of Michigan State. And here is the chemistry laboratory building. You can barely make it out here. A nice sign here, the botanical garden, botanic garden pointing in this direction. There's the bridge, the same tree you saw. But notice how all those beds of all the different families of plants have now expanded up into this portion of the garden. In the earlier photograph, uh, this was just all a little grassy uh, depression. And here we have some more shots of the garden. This is the stream that once flowed right through the heart mm. of the Beale Garden. By the beginning of the last century, this stream had become very polluted with a lot of runoff. Remember back in this time, the major form of horsepower was horse, <laughs> not internal combustion engine. And we had a different kind of pollution. We didn't have smog and air pollution, but we had ground pollution in terms of road apples. And so a lot of waste would uh, wash down the streets and into this, and become uh, the area would become polluted. So it was put underground. Uh, as a storm sort. Question? I was just wondering, do you, do you know what the uh, tree is there? I'm not sure. Uh, it, it looks like it might be a type of willow, but I, I couldn't really say. Another shot, a uh, woman in period dress there, and uh, one of the uh, stairs, seven stairs that's coming down to the garden. Today, the main library would be up in this area, and this is now a set of concrete stairs that comes down through the garden. But again, all the different plant beds, the various families, labels identifying what the plants are. There's a very nice, several nice natural occurring ponds that occurred in the garden back at this time. Uh, the Red Cedar River meanders, and as it meandered, created little depressions of oxbows. And these were natural water features that Beale took advantage of in the garden uh, to create water plant collections. So we can actually see the plants labeled here in the, uh, the beds. A gentleman standing here on a rock in the middle of the pond. The gentleman back here is Professor Beale. And we speculate that might be his granddaughter. We're not exactly sure, but we do know from uh, looking at the photograph close up, Professor Beale standing there in the background uh, quite a bit later on in years. And here's another photograph of some of the wet areas back 
uh, turn of the century. Nice meandering path. So the character of the garden, as you see, they refer to as the wild garden, had a lot of characteristics of, of the wild natural features of the campus before it was developed. And here we can see a little bit later on again in time, here is again shot from about the same location as the earlier two photographs. But many years later on, the original Wells Hall has since been removed, and here is the second Wells Hall that was constructed uh, back at about what's now the south wall of the library and the parking area. And here again is the chemistry laboratory, but here we can see the large collection of plants uh, laid out in a, in a uh, snaking group of beds followed transverse by a variety of trails and paths. Postcards from the past. It's always fun to get an old postcard. And I, I love this one. This person must have been studying hieroglyphics because when you look at it very carefully, he uses all little glyphs, little symbols, uh, way before the age of, of, of computers and such. And he has little things, a little eye there for eye and, and, and such. But it's, it's a lot of fun. And he even mentions Egypt. But the main thing I like to point out here is the Wild Garden at Cultural College of East Lansing. This is the Beale Botanical Garden down here, and that in the end is the chemistry laboratory. So about 1904. This is an interesting part of the garden, and again, we're um, into the early part of the century. Professor Beale sitting there on the right-hand side. This is the pond. This is the location where the pond is today in the garden. The pond that we have today is a cement line pond rather than being a natural water feature and it was constructed shortly after the whole garden was redesigned in the 1950s. And this is the original log cabin, a little log cabin they used for the garden shed and that was also replaced in about the 1950s with the garden shed that we have down there today uh, which was originally designed and installed about 50 years ago. This is a, another shot which is very interesting because we're looking up to the bank where the greenhouses were and the headhouse facility. And we'll see a photograph of this a little bit later on. But what's very fascinating is that this is dominated now by the main library. So the library on the campus is there. This tree, which is a fairly young Norway spruce, is now a very old Norway spruce growing up on the ridge. And it's the one that we believe is the one that has a rather large branch that curves up and is becoming a secondary main, uh, main spout, uh, sprout. So take a look at that and, and imagine uh, that tree about 100 years ago, and we still have it with us today. Now this is a shot, I think maybe the person must have climbed up that tree or something to get this. I'm not sure how they got this photograph. What we can see here is the glass house. This is the original greenhouses. We're up on top now. The garden is off to the right and down the hill. This is the north side of the, uh, the greenhouse facility and headhouse. You see cold frames and test beds for a growing variety of plants. And uh, must have been a very beautiful facility at the time. Well, one of the things that I mentioned about Professor Beale's work was an experiment that he started back in 1879 when he buried 20 bottles of seeds on the campus to understand more about how long the seeds live. I mean, we knew that seeds can live for a fairly long time, but nobody knew exactly how long. And so he designed the experiment so that every year or every other year or so, he'd open up a bottle, shake out the soil that contained the seeds, and see what germinated. And then things just kept surviving. So he said, well, I'm going to expand it every five years. And then eventually the experiment was spent every 10 years. And on the 100th anniversary in 1980, it was decided that the bottles would be opened every 20 years. And so I had the opportunity to help dig up and, and experiment with the last bottles that were opened in the year 2000. And the one plant that has consistently grown for us has been the Verbascum blatteria. And here we can see these are the plants that were produced from the seeds that Professor Beale buried 120 years ago. And so there they are flowering very nicely and we were able to um, produce seed from them and produce more plants from them. So we kind of figured that when we needed a symbol for the Beale Botanical Garden, we wanted to come up with a logo, why not use the flower or the mothball? And gee, it's a common weed in a lot of ways to a lot of people. But it symbolizes the longevity of the Beale Garden and Professor Beale's long-term commitment and accomplishments uh, to the field of botany and horticulture. This is one of the original bottles, photograph one of the original bottles that were buried uh, on the campus. Well, after Professor Beale retired, Johannes Uphoff became the curator from about 1912 to about 1913. 
And shortly after that, Professor Darlington arrived on campus in 1914 and became the new director of the Botanic Gardens and served in that capacity until 1930. Uh, on December 17, 1924, shortly after the death of Professor Beale, the State Board of Agriculture approved the recommendation that the Department of Botany name the Botanic Garden the W.J. Beale Botanical Garden. And so that's how we got the official name of the garden in honor of Professor Beale. H.L.R. Chapman in, uh, was hired in 1925 by Professor Darlington, and he was a trainee of the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew. Uh, the gardens, Professor Eagle and Professor Beale's time, had many links to many famous gardens around the world, including Kew Gardens and the Arnold Arboretum, and received many plants from those institutions to plant on campus. And so continuing with that tradition, uh, Mr. Chapman joined the garden as the head gardener and superintendent, and he would serve until 1949. Uh, in that capacity. Well, Professor Darlington had a concept for expanding the Botanic Garden and, it, and adding to it, and in February of 1928, drafted up this particular sketch of the garden to show some of the new features that he wanted to add to the garden to increase its value to the MSU, or at this time, MAC community, Michigan Agricultural College. And we see again the gymnasium where it was located, Circle Drive, the present garden, not including Sleeping Hollow, the chemistry building was still there in 1928, as were the greenhouses and Wells Hall. And by the way, this is the English department right there. So we can see we have many things, ecological garden, uh, we have uh, for research purposes, a prairie planting, um, state flowers uh, collection, ornamental shrubs. And one of the things that I really, really enjoyed very much is when I was doing research on the history of Beale Garden. And your friend of mine, Jane Taylor, of course, you know, created the Children's Garden at Michigan State. Um, came to my mind when I came over here and was investigating this area right here, and lo and behold, in 1928, Professor Darlington proposed a children's garden on the campus of Michigan State. And so when Jane saw that, she just loved it. She thought that was really, really neat. Uh, unfortunately, this whole addition to the garden was never uh, realized, and it became quite, uh, quite controversial for Professor Darlington. The plans were viewed as being too grand and not able to be maintained. And so the superintendent of the grounds challenged Professor Darlington, and it went clear to the board of trustees. Uh, and as a result, uh, Professor Darlington was removed as director, and Mr. Chapman was assigned to curatorial do uh, duties uh, throughout the 1930s and 1940s. When President Hanna took on uh, over campus, he created the division of park, uh, campus park and planning. And campus park and planning is a unique development in academic environments. Most grounds departments and planning offices are part of the physical plan. And Michigan State is actually one of the only colleges, I think it's now only one of two, another school has emul emulated our, our lead, to separate the landscape function and maintenance from the physical plan to ensure the beauty of the campus and the green nature of the campus. Uh, he felt very inspired by the large open green spaces, the large trees, the beautiful gardens and stuff of the campus, and wanted to see that attitude preserved, uh, that feature of the campus preserved. He also observed that there was a decline in the role and mission of the Beale Botanical Garden, and felt very strongly that there needed to be a transfer of authority and leadership, and so put the garden under the auspices of a newly found uh, Division of Campus Park and Planning, where it is still today as an administrative unit. And it was under this, at this time that Harold Lautner, the director of this new division of campus park and planning, uh, working with his staff, led to a redesign and redevelopment of the garden. And at the time, Dr. William Drew from the Department of Botany would serve as a technical advisor. So there wasn't a complete break between the academic department and the, um, the administration of the garden. So they still keep ties to the botany department. So Dr. Gilly, became, uh, who was an assistant professor of botany, also served as the curator of the Botanical Gardens in 1950 in the interim. And Professor Milt Barron, who was a landscape architect professor, became the curator after that in 1951 to 1954. And it was really under uh, Professor Barron's uh, watch that a lot of the reorganization and redesign of the entire garden took place, creating four major sections that we know today. So the garden that you see today is really a product of this time period and the work of Milt Barron. 
the systematic section, the economic section, the ecological section, and the landscape section are all very dominant in that design. And we can see from one of these early sketches of Professor Ferens the conceptual layout of the garden. And you can see many of the features as you would see them today. Here is the systematic section. West Circle Drive is over here, the main library, again, being up on this side. Here is that walk that joins the little gazebo here, which is originally a feature of Cole's house when it was moved to this location. Little brick path that goes across. And then this is the economic collection. The new pool that was put in and the new garden shed that would be built right over here. And here is another set of steps at the end of the garden. And here's another photograph of the Beale Garden, taken later, many years later, <coughs> showing a little bit more modern dress than we've seen in some of the previous shots. But again, it shows the old log cabin before it was replaced and the old original uh, lily pond as it was before it became a concrete pond. And again, what's interesting here is we see the term sunken garden rather than the W.J. Beale Botanical Garden. So a much more appealing name maybe for postcard than sunken garden. But certainly by this time, the garden was known as W.J. Beale Botanical Garden. So George Parmalee became the curator in 1955 and would serve until 1986. And under uh, George Parmalee's direction, George introduced, built upon a concept that Professor Beale started of interpretive labels. And Professor Beale had started these interpretive labels really in about the 1870s, 1880s. And George Parmalee took this concept and expanded it by adding a great deal of interpretive information. So when you go to the Beale Garden and you read a plant label, not only do you know what the plant is, both its common name and scientific name, and what family it belongs to, and where you can find it in the world, but you also may find some interesting information. Is it used to cure a disease? Does it produce a dye or perfume? If it's in a plant family collection, what is it related to, and what are some of the interesting features of this particular plant? Is it rare and endangered? We have a new collection that looks rare and endangered plants as well. So here we see a picture from our archives uh, shortly after the redesign, it's taken about the 1960s based on the, again, the clothing that we see uh, being worn in the garden. But we can see these two by two wood stakes with a wooden uh, back and an engraved label were installed at this point in time. And this type of plant labeling system remained in use in the garden until uh, a few years ago when we upgraded and started using metal stakes, a little bit slimmer. Uh, and, and more streamlined and hopefully we're hoping a little bit more durable as these would eventually rot out with time and need to be replaced uh, periodically. We don't quite know what the longevity of our new metal stakes are, but we'll find out. One of the things that we, I always find is an interesting story was told to me by one of our uh, botanical gardens technicians that during a great flood in the 1970s, the water level had risen through the garden all the way up to the steps, uh, to at least the first step uh, on the far end of the garden by Circle Drive. And a lot of these labels started popping out of the ground and started floating down the Red Cedar River. So hopefully with our new metal signs, this will not be a problem. Uh, although last, uh, about two years ago, we had a flood and then a great freeze. And we had huge ice flows in the Beale Garden. And when the water level dropped and this heavy mass of ice was there, it came down and it bent a lot of our metal labels by pushing them down. So you, you can't win. No matter what technology you use, Mother Nature will find a way to thwart you and make your life interesting. So here we see um, a more modern version of the garden. Again, at this time it's called the Beale Garfield Garden, and I'm still not completely sure about how and when the name Garfield got attached to it. Uh, Garfield, uh, I'm not sure even which Garfield it is. There was a Garfield who worked with Professor Beals, particularly in the area of forestry. He came from the Grand Rapids area and was involved with the early version of what is today the DNR. And so my speculation, it might have been uh, that particular Garfield, but it was never fully adopted and it is still known as the W.J. Beale Botanical Garden and not the Beale Garfield Garden. But again, here's the systematic section with all its numbered beds. And we can see the economic collection has been expanded down towards the river. Remember, truncated about here in the earlier drawings. And the collection of landscape plants have been expanded past the intramural building. And we have the ecological collections now along the slopes here. And again, here's Sleepy Hollow and the music building. But you can see how the size of the buildings just over time has just really changed uh, the whole features of the campus. But the garden remains a concept, a concept. In 1973, the garden celebrated its centennial, 
And Resolution 116 commemorated the 100th anniversary by declaring the week of May 12th through May 19th of 1973 mm -hmm. as William James Beale Week. After Dr. Donnelly, I mean after Dr. Uh, Parmelee retired, Dr. Gerard Darnell, uh, Donnelly became the curator of the garden and served from 1986 until 1990. Uh, Dr. Donnelly was responsible for creating the Endangered and Threatened Species Plants uh, collection in the garden and was the first to actually start computer mapping and inventorying of trees on campus as part of his duties also as curators, as my duty as curator of the Campus Arboretum. <coughs> Uh, meeting the needs of the collection, so the role of the curator was redefined in 1990 after the departure of Dr. Donnelly, who took over as the executive director of the Morton Arboretum. And basically there's a lot of, ex uh, there's a strong expectation in the academic environment uh, community that the curator be involved, re-involved with the academic component of the university as well as administering the garden. And so when the position was redirected, the position I have now, it was set up to be joint once again, between the Department of Botany, which is now the Department of Plant Biology, and Campus Park and Planning. And so I have a shared appointment that brings the two elements of the university back together as reflected in the garden. And so I arrived in 1993. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, working on establishing an unflowering bachelor plant collection uh, and an endowed trust for the garden. We currently have about three and a half million dollars uh, endowment for the garden we're very mm -hmm. pleased about. And uh, anybody who would like to help us with that, we're always willing to, to talk to you. And Elaine Chittenden was hired in the newly created position of the collections manager. And so as part of the redesign of the structure of the garden management and redefining the, the duties of the curator, it was also decided that the garden needed to have a collections manager to help with the day-to-day -day management of the collections, the data collection, the database operation. And Elaine is also, as many of you are aware of, I see many of the volunteers here from the Beale Garden today, uh, establishing the volunteer and docent programs that operate so successfully in the garden today. So and finally, in the early history of the Botanic Garden was known as a place of, for peaceful romantic strolls. In the year of 2001, the Beale Garden was voted the most romantic place in the greater Lansing area by the People's <laughs> Choice Competition. So back then, a wonderful place for a stroll, and even today, many students who uh, come to the campus uh, reflect very fondly on their days uh, in the Beale Garden, and many of them come back and actually uh, take their vows in the garden. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>